Hi, everybody. That's my signal. When I hear the recording in progress, I know that we're starting. Welcome to the Virtual Night Sky. Welcome to our uh, end of January version of Virtual Night Sky. And for those of you who have joined us before, I know we have a lot of followers. I know people like to uh, kind of stay up with us. So welcome back. And I'm glad you're still with us. And uh, anybody that's new that is just joining for the first time, uh, welcome. You're going to find out this is an hour long and it's a lot of fun and we get to learn a lot. And really the big theme, the big, big basic theme is, uh, you know, what's going on in space and then what do we get to see from here? This is really about connecting us to the night sky, but doing it on a very, very local and personal level to sort of like, you know, right here looking up and seeing the sky around us. Uh, I am from Arizona State University. My name is Rick Alling and I work in a public outreach capacity uh, with my uh, colleague Meg Hunt. She's with me today. And, and typically, Meg and I are in charge of having people just kind of come visit us at school. You guys get to come and see our spaces. We have a gallery, we have a really wonderful theater to, to do uh, space-themed uh, education in. And uh, But with COVID, of course, we've not been doing that. And we invented this virtual night sky just to kind of keep track of our audience, make sure you guys have something to do, keep communication going. And uh, we'll be back uh, soon enough. We just have to get through some of these little COVID surges. And uh, we're expecting uh, later this semester, uh, just a little bit later in the spring, I, I suspect we're going to be able to have everybody back to campus. So we'll let you know. Until then, every other Wednesday night, come back and join us. We decided to start this year with uh, a couple of things. And uh, starting the new year, starting over, uh, New, new members coming in. Um, we thought actually a really good way to do this is just kind of like do a little four evening version of just how the sky works. Two weeks ago, we started with the stars. Uh, so version two is tonight and it's all about the moon. You might have heard that from the intro music. Um, today is about the moon and we're going to talk about the moon and its cycles and phases. And uh, I'm going to give you so many definitions of a lunar month uh, that you'll never remember. And uh, we'll talk about why um, why the moon's important and how important it is culturally uh, to uh, to people around the world. So this was kind of a, kind of about the moon. Um, to, with me tonight, not only is Meg, who I already said, but Kim Baptista is your webmaster, and she's the one who keeps the communication going. And thank you very much, Kim, for all your work. Um, it's uh, it's not easy to kind of keep these things organized and keep the information out and keep everybody up to date on what's going on. And so we depend on Kim to do that. She does a great job. Also, I have two students that you have been, uh, you've, you've known, if you've been with us before, they've been around for a little while. And I keep saying students, but Alicia Hyatt is with us and she is a, is a former student, now she is an employee. So uh, this is one of her roles she continues to do with us. And uh, thank you, Alicia, for coming. Um, also, uh, Alex Blanche, you know him, he really is a student. And he's been, actually, he's been doing this program, I think, continuously uh, since the very, very beginning. I'm not sure, Alex, you've even missed one. So uh, so thank you very much for that, for your service. And then I went to introduce you to a new face today. Armin, would you just kind of come on and introduce yourself? Uh, brand new, uh, Armin has been an employee of ours for, oh, just about uh, uh, about three or four months. He's did some volunteering before that. And uh, let me see if I can get him on the screen so you guys can meet him. Hey there, how you doing? Uh, yes. Introduce yourself, what you doing here? Yeah, so my name is Armand Dalla. I'm a junior at ASU studying art and space exploration. Uh, I sort of um, joined the Marston theater team uh, at the end of last semester, and I've watched quite a few of these virtual night sky shows. So it's really exciting to be on the other side for once. Excellent, really good. And so uh, tell us where you're from and why did you pick ASU as a place to pursue your studies? So I'm from Singapore. I know quite a little far away, but other side of the world. Yeah, pretty much. But um, ASU is one of the leading um, universities in terms of space flight, and they have a lot of cool things going on with NASA as well. So that's one of the main reasons I chose to come to ASU. Excellent. That's a very good reason, and, uh, yeah. and uh, I find it well. So welcome very much, and uh, so Arvon, uh, with uh, some of the others, uh, Alex and Alicia, we we'll kind of work in the background, fielding your questions. Uh, we don't chat in this particular version of our uh, 
of our webinar. But we do encourage questions and uh, it's a really good way to communicate with us. So you can make comments in there or you can really do questions. We really depend on your questions and you'll see as we go along, uh, you'll drop a question in there. It could get answered right away and that's because some of the students in the background are doing that. And then we will pull some of your questions right up to breaks and, and sort of like uh, do those live on campus. But we really need the questions, keep them going, uh, be familiar with that. The tonight's program is in several parts, uh, and I am going to get to the moon part, but that's going to be the second half of the program. That's chapter two. Before we get there, I wanted to just introduce you to one of the most really remarkable lunar missions that I've ever heard of. I mean, it's really, it's just really amazing, and you're going to find out uh, uh, this is amazing science, and it's very local. This is a, a mission that was developed right here at ASU campus. The little spacecraft was built right here at ASU campus, and uh, I have with me tonight uh, Professor uh, Craig Hargrove, and he is a, we're going to uh, just to take the first part of the show. We're going to kind of interview him a little bit and learn more about a very, very special lunar mission. As we get into it, I forgot to just say, um, <clears throat> You guys are in charge of your own closed captioning. If you like it, go ahead and leave it on your screen and all of that stuff. And uh, um, and uh, we'll uh, uh, just uh, take periodic breaks so that you guys can, uh, can kind of get organized and get settled and, uh, and we'll deal with questions. But keep those questions coming in. Craig, let me welcome you to the screen and uh, we'll start there. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hey, <laughs> thanks for having me. There you go. Um, Welcome. There, I, now we can see your face. Let's okay. Your face. <laughs> Hi. So, Craig, I think what we were going to do is uh, just to, just kind of start with a quick, quick video. Uh, the if the audience uh, remembers, it was about a year ago, and we actually interviewed Joe Dubois, who actually works in your uh, in your lab, right, and uh, was part of right. the development team. And there's a video that introduces him and you and the spacecraft and all that stuff. Let's just start there, and then we'll kind of get into a little talk. Mm -hmm. The spacecraft itself is only about 30 pounds and it's about the size of a Costco cereal box. I'm Joe Dubois. I'm the lead mechanical engineer on LunaMap. It's a spacecraft going to the moon in search of water. The other day we were, we were lifting the spacecraft. You know, we just pick it up and put it in the, the thermal chamber and, and take it out. We wheel it on a cart across the room. My name's Craig Hardgrove. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and I'm the principal investigator of the Luna Map mission. So you might be wondering, how do we search for water without landing on the moon? It's quite fascinating. We have to look for neutrons, and, and neutrons aren't coming from the water itself, but they're getting knocked off by cosmic rays. And that's some pretty deep science. But more or less, what we know is that when we fly over, with the presence of these neutrons, we can safely say that there's hydrogen, which means there's water. We know we need water either as fuel or to support people uh, because you know, it, it's expensive to launch stuff off of the Earth. Uh, so if there are resources on the moon that we could harness uh, either to go to Mars or to support some base on the moon, then it would be valuable to know how much there is and exactly where it is. Super. So that's a, that's a great little introduction to you and, uh, and the mission. But let's learn more about the science. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, I have some slides I can share here. Um, let's see if I can get this going. You guys uh, all see those? Yep. Let's see, get that going, and then uh, does that look right? Yeah, that looks good. Yep, it looks great. Good. All right. Um, so yeah, I like the video said. I'm the principal investigator uh, for this mission. Uh, I came up with this crazy idea, and uh, NASA <laughs> seemed to think it was an okay idea too. So uh, you got to see the spacecraft and how how tiny it is, and that's that's really, I think, one of the main uh, most novel things about this mission. Um, and because it's small, uh, all the elements of this mission are very small. Um, our budget is small. Our number of team members is small. Um, but because of that, it enables us to do some really exciting things. Um, and we're leveraging a lot of technologies that have been developed over the last 10 to 20 years um, in CubeSats. You've probably heard of CubeSats. They're these tiny, uh, they're, this, originally they were designed to be the size of Beanie Baby boxes um, because that's when they were invented. Uh, the, the, the person who came up with it had a granddaughter who was into Beanie Babies and thought, I'm going to come up with a, a form factor for my engineering students that's so small they couldn't ever possibly do anything useful with it. 
Um, and so uh, the, they, they did that for like 10 years and they said, you know, design all these components, radios, reaction wheels, all the things you'd see in a spacecraft and have them fit in this tiny little box. And the students were amazing, uh, all these different universities throughout the world. And uh, over the past really 10, 15 years, uh, students have developed a lot of these technologies and then spun off companies, companies out of Stanford and uh, other, other places, MIT. Uh, students have formed companies and, and made professional versions of these parts. And so Lunamap is a product of uh, really two decades of, of technologies that started at universities. Uh, and now you know, we're, we're purchasing parts from companies that were started by students uh, 15 years ago. Um, and, and you'll see, I'll show you all the different components that are in this spacecraft. Um, but it's really, it's the size of like a small briefcase. Sometimes we call it a couple cereal boxes, maybe a large Costco cereal box. But it has all the components that you'd see on a, on a large spacecraft like, like these. So the reason I put all these up is because I wanted to talk primarily about the science, like Rick said, and where the idea for this mission came from. And the idea really comes from uh, neutron spectroscopy, which is really, a, it's a remote sensing tool. A lot of the ways we learn things about planets in the solar system is by what particles come off of them. We're most familiar with the light that gets reflected off of them. Um, but neutrons are coming off of all the planet, planets as well. And so you can fly a neutron detector in orbit around all these different planets that I'm showing here. I'm showing uh, the moon in the bottom. We've sent two different neutron detectors to the moon in the past. On the top left, uh, that's Vesta. Uh, we sent a neutron detector to both Vesta and Ceres with the Dawn mission. Um, the top middle is Mars. We've mapped uh, globally the distribution of water across the surface of Mars with a neutron detector. In the upper right, we've actually sent a neutron detector to Mercury as well. And then in the middle, I just put little tiny Luna map. It'll be another part of this story. It's to be the third neutron detector that we've sent to the moon. And hopefully I can explain to you guys uh, why. So this picture is really where it all starts. Um, does anybody, I guess I can't take questions from the, the audience, uh, but uh, th this is meant to show cosmic rays. Um, this is where neutrons come okay, from. I, I get it. Okay, thanks thank for you. Explaining. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Typically, there'd be like an audience and, and I would get some kind of reaction. <laughs> uh, so yeah, these are, these are cosmic rays that bombard every planet in the solar system, even Earth. And the reason we don't get affected by them is because we have a nice thick atmosphere with, that absorbs most of these cosmic rays, but the moon isn't so fortunate. And neither is Mars, neither are all those other planetary bodies that I showed you. Um, so a lot of those high energy cosmic rays get all the way down to the surface. And this is a complicated diagram that shows all the things that can happen to them. Um, but really the only thing that you need to know for a neutron detector to work is that neutrons get made from these cosmic rays, interactions with the cosmic rays and all the atoms that make up the rocks, the dirt, the soil that's at the surface. And the principle of a neutron detector is just the more hydrogen that you have in the ground, uh, the more energy those neutrons lose because a hydrogen atom really looks exactly like a, a neutron in terms of mass. Everything else in the periodic table that's geologically relevant looks like a bowling ball to a neutron. So if you have a neutron hitting an iron atom or any other atom in the periodic table, uh, it just bounces off with about the same energy in the opposite direction. But if there's hydrogen in the ground, you wind up losing energy, about half the energy of the neutron every time it collides with the hydrogen atom. And so this principle uh, is what's used to make all these maps. So I'll show you just the global map of hydrogen on Mars. We know that the, one of the reasons we know that the poles of Mars are hydrated is from a neutron detector. Um, and you can see that the places that we've landed rovers around the equator actually have some enrichments of hydrogen due to clay minerals and other things that are um, bound up in the rocks and soils there. And this is what the moon looks like, but just in a polar projection. There's not a lot of hydrogen at the equator of the moon where the astronauts landed. Um, but we do have samples and we can see that it's in sort of a 10 to 50 parts per million, really very small amounts of water. And the amount of water that we're talking about at the poles, which is shown here, uh, illuminated by a neutron detector, is more on the scale of maybe 200 to 500 parts per million. But we're really not sure because the pixel scale that you can see there, I put 150 square kilometers. So it's incredibly large. So many, many miles, uh, in some cases, you know, tens to, to hundreds of miles. Um, per pixel in terms of what we've mapped here. So we know there's an enrichment at the pole, but we're not entirely sure where it is. 
Um, and that's, this is another uh, projection of the neutron data just to show that there are concentrations, but they're very broad. And we really haven't been able to discern where it is, but there are other measurements that we've made of the moon uh, with other optical instruments. And so this is again, part of the story of sort of building up to LunaMap. Um, one of the other things that we did with the Dawn mission that I mentioned was a neutron detector. And you might remember this bright spot on Ceres. And towards the end of the Dawn mission, they wanted to get really low. So they got the Dawn spacecraft into a, a elliptical orbit, which is one where they dipped really low over this bright spot uh, in Akater Crater so that they could make a higher resolution map with the neutron detector of what was, what was going on. What was the hydration? Was this a hydrated thing that was being erupted from in the middle of this crater? And the mapping that was done is shown on the right. And you can see that actually the, the interior of the crater was found to not really be very hydrated at all but it shows that the exterior of the crater, what was excavated from the crater, enriched the surrounding materials in hydrogen. So that tells an interesting story. Uh, the materials that were originally uh, sitting on Ceres were hydrated and then they got exhumed by this impact, but what's sitting underneath is less hydrated. So that tells an interesting geologic story about Ceres, but it was enabled by this low altitude, really elliptical mapping orbit. Uh, that they did of Ceres with the neutron detector. And you have to do this kind of orbit with a neutron detector because the inherent spatial scale of these instruments is very, very broad, like I said. So in order to get a re better resolution, you have to get really low, close to the surface. So that's really the, the crux of where LunaMap came from. We have these broad maps of the moon that we know the hydrogen is there and we know it's likely water ice, but we're not entirely sure where it is. So we wanna get really close like what we did on Ceres. Um, and that's where the LunaMap mission came in. And so this is LunaMap um, actually manifested. I delivered the spacecraft to NASA, which I'll show you guys uh, a short video of uh, us delivering the spacecraft. And it, it got loaded into this uh, stage adapter that you see here. And that's LunaMap sort of loaded into that um, dispenser. And it's, it's there with 10 other spacecraft that will be dispensed similarly to us uh, after the SLS launches sometime, uh, hopefully in a few months here. And the mission was selected in 2015, and I, I've already kind of explained sort of the size and, and what we're planning to do. Um, so these are just some pictures of the spacecraft um, when we delivered it in July. That's me. Um, I was the last person to touch it, so I got to unscrew what's called a remove before flight switch. Uh, and then we shut the door. Uh, they heard a click when we shut the door on the dispenser, and everybody clapped because <laughs> uh, it's a big deal to you know have everything closed nicely. And that's the team that was there for delivery. Uh, with us nicely uh, buttoned up inside the, the dispenser. Um, and I just have some slides just to, to show you the spacecraft and uh, what we hope to accomplish. So this is called a fleet chart for the, we're funded out of the NASA Science Mission Directorate. So you're probably familiar with the Psyche mission, which is uh, another mission that's being uh, managed here out of ASU. Um, but this is the entire science mission fleet. And you can see LunaMap there in, in the moon. So if you just zoom in, on the moon section. I wanted to show this just because it's not to scale. If you ever see this as shown, uh, this is actually somewhat closer to the actual scale of our spacecraft compared to these other spacecraft that are planned to go uh, to the moon at the surface. Uh, the Viper mission is supposed to land in 2023, I believe, and Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has a camera that's also run out of ASU. Uh, Mark Robinson uh, is a professor here that uh, is the PI of that camera is a very, very large spacecraft, you know, many rooms uh, size spacecraft with about uh, 12 different science instruments. So we have one science instrument and we're the size of a you know, Costco cereal box. Um, and then if you're not familiar with the lunar environment, we might talk about this or Rick might talk about this later, but at the poles, there are regions of the poles that don't ever see sunlight. In fact, we think that these are some of the coldest places in the entire solar system. Depending on which models you believe about the evolution of the solar system, these may have never seen sunlight. Uh, since the moon was was condensed uh, out of this uh, accretionary disk with the collision with Earth, um, but this is this is just the temperatures of the South Pole. So those are in Kelvin. You can see at the the scale bar in these purple regions. That's about negative four hundred and fifty degrees Fahrenheit for these areas in the in these bottoms of permanently shadowed craters. The crater rims come up around the surroundings, and then the sunlight is at this very low angle. And certain craters, the sunlight just cannot get into the bottoms of the craters. And so these are the only areas of the moon that we think that water ice could really be concentrated. And it was either delivered by passing asteroids or comets over the history of the solar system, um, or it's been implanted by solar wind. 
hydrogen gets created by these protons from the solar wind, and then it migrates around and finds its way into these cold traps, again, over geologic timescales, millions and millions of years. And we don't really know how it got there. And that means we don't really have a great upper limit on how much there could be. Um, so we, we want to understand that with this mission as well, um, and really answer some of these fundamental questions about where the water came from, and where are the concentrations so that we can plan future missions. So these are just some of the areas. Um, on the left side, you can see the red are areas of permanent shadow that have been mapped with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. Um, so those are all the places that are the most interesting that we think that based on you know, thermal stability diagrams where water ice should be stable. Um, and then you can see on the right, the neutron map. And there are areas where there are a lot of permanently shadowed regions and the neutron map agrees where we'd say, yeah, okay, there's more hydrogen there. But there you can see there's areas where there are lots of permanently shadowed regions and then we don't actually see a lot of hydration. Um, like that upper right quadrant. So these are areas that will hopefully be able to enrich our understanding of where this hydrogen is. And we're going to do that by, like I said, flying really low. So this is just showing one of our ground tracks across Shoemaker Crater. And you can see it in the bottom right, that's how, how close Lunamap will get to the surface of the moon, just about 10 kilometers, uh, the distance from ASU to Camelback, kind of if you're familiar with uh, the, the geography around here. Um, and then you can see the, the really key thing for the science is that the contribution of the Shoemaker interior of Shoemaker Crater to the neutron detector gets to almost 80%. So previous missions, we were sitting at 20, 30% or so. Um, we're really primarily sensitive to what the hydration of the interior of Shoemaker is when we're making those low altitude flybys. So this is the spacecraft that, that I showed you. And so this is how we do that. Uh, we have a set of solar arrays. Uh, we have a radio that communicates back to Earth. Um, the real enabling technology, as aside from the neutron detector, is our propulsion system. Uh, so we have a propulsion system that's about the size of a tissue box that you might have in your house. Um, and we use solid iodine fuel. And we shoot, we vaporize that and accelerate it out the back of the spacecraft. And the force or the thrust that we get is really equivalent to like dropping a human hair on a table. So it's not very much, but if you do that over many, many hours, you can change the velocity of your spacecraft and change the overall orbit. So I'll show you how we do that on a, on a subsequent slide, but um, we have a, a little bus we call the spacecraft bus, which is the power system, the batteries, uh, star tracker, uh, the, the solar rays rotate, um, and a flight computer with flight software. So all the, all the things you'd see on a normal spacecraft um, just shrunk down and miniaturized. Um, and of course we don't have all the redundant systems that you would see on a large spacecraft. Um, and this is uh, the propulsion system in action, uh, just showing it actually firing in a thermal vacuum chamber. Um, so we were able to successfully demonstrate this system on Earth prior to uh, integrating it into the spacecraft and, and delivering it to, the, to NASA. And then this is again, like I said, how we're gonna do it. So we deploy, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but we deploy, this is Earth in the middle of this number one graphic. And then we deploy, from SLS. And then this little swing by here is actually the moon. So this red circle here is the orbit of the moon around the earth. And so we do, we target about uh, 48 hours after we deploy from SLS, we have to target a lunar gravity assist with our propulsion system and do this swing by of the moon. And that shoots us out to about where James Webb is right now. And so we have to go to what's called the weak stability boundary. That could take us anywhere from about a year to two years, depending on the launch date. And then we come back and meet up with the moon. Um, and so that is sort of the whole mission duration. And this period here, this number three, is our science mission. And that takes only about two months. And we'll get into this orbit where we're at this very low altitude over the South Pole so we can make those maps that I was talking about. Um, and then we go into this high altitude orbit over the uh, North Pole of the moon. And we do that about 282 times. These are the ground tracks uh, that we'll make across the South Pole of the Moon. The regions of interest are these permanently shadowed regions I've shown are these circles. Um, and then the green circle is 12 kilometers above the moon. And the yellow circle, large one here, is when we're about 10 kilometers uh, over the moon. And so uh, these are the maps that we hope to make. So we don't know what we're going to see. Um, because we don't know what the hydrogen distribution or the water distribution is at this spatial scale. So we can take those orbits and the sensitivities that we know of the detector, and we can populate the permanently shattered regions with different amounts of hydrogen based on papers that have been written, people's theories. Uh, it's the best we can do at this scale. 
and we can say, well, what map would we make? And that's the map you see on the right. And the great thing about this map on the right is that we actually can resolve one permanently shadowed region from another. If the permanent, if the ice is contained within the regions of permanent shadow only, we'll be able to see that. But if it extends out into the ejecta, like I showed you for Ceres, where the water ice has actually been kicked out into the areas around the permanently shadowed craters, that would be interesting too. That would tell a different geologic story and we'd be able to resolve that. It's also really important because we'll be able to help plan future missions to the South Pole of the Moon. So this pixel scale that we'll be mapping at is right around the scale of a landing ellipse for a rover or a human mission that might be planned in the future. So we want to know if the ice is in places that aren't in permanent shadow, because those are places we can actually send humans that can, they can survive there. They can put shovels down and actually start um, seeing if we can access that as a resource for future missions. And the rest of the slides I have are just pictures. So this is us delivering the spacecraft. Um, we, we put it in this Pelican case that you saw, I think, in the, in the previous video. Um, and then that's me at the airport. We actually had to get a ticket for the spacecraft. So that's me holding both tickets, one for me, uh, one for the spacecraft, because we had to book it a seat and it got its own uh, seat. And then that's me uh, sending some emails, I think, to, my, to the team, making sure that they knew uh, we got there safely. And that's, you can see the, the seat belt around the spacecraft buckled in uh, safely for the flight. Um, and then we got there, we, we put in the rental car, uh, we got to uh, NASA Kennedy, and uh, this is after we put it into the dispenser, they actually used the crane that they used to, to move all the parts for SLS. So this is like a, a thousand ton crane, <laughs> rated crane that they were using to, to lift our 50 pound spacecraft um, up off the ground and mount it into that ring that I showed you before. So this is where they put it. Uh, they actually, you know, mounted it in here, screwed it in, made sure it was was in there. And then um, there's a video. I didn't have it, but they, I think NASA put it on Twitter. You can actually see them taking the Orion capsule, which is the primary payload for the Artemis One mission, and stacking it on top of that that ring, this ring that you see here. Um, and then this is us at the at the VAB, the Vehicle Assembly Building, uh, after we delivered. And and this is before Orion got stacked on the top. But you can see uh, where we'll go up on the top there at the very top of the rocket. So um, I think that was the last slide I had, Rick, um, just to kind of to give everybody Craig, a did, feel for where we're at. Yeah. This is really an unbelievable story. I just can't believe it, that, you know, some device that you guys can just create in, in clean rooms right at ASU and uh, it's on its way to do this amazing mission. I just think it's an amazing story. So, so congratulations. I mean, you're sort of, I guess, where are you in the mission? Is this, is this what you call kind of the halfway port, right? You've delivered the product. Now you wait for, for wait for it to launch. And, yeah, we, we and delivered in July. Do science. Yeah, yeah we, we delivered in July and we've been um, ramping up the operations preparation. So our navigation team that has to execute all of those maneuvers that I showed you guys. Absolutely. Um, has been working with our operations team here at ASU to make sure that they're interfacing correctly. So the navigation team is going to tell us, all right, you know, maneuver in this direction for X number of hours. We need to make sure that what we send to the spacecraft is going to get the job done. Um, so I think we have a total of 14 different rehearsals, uh, three or four different operational readiness tests. And we've been going through those. I think we just finished rehearsal six today. Uh, so we've got another six planned before if launches in March, we'll be, we'll be ready for a, a late March launch. Um, and so we've been going back and forth with the nav team, uh, making sure that we've got the tools and everything's in place to, to get us to that first lunar swing by, because that's really make or break for us. Uh, we have to hit that gravity assist. Otherwise, uh, we might not make it back to the moon. So, wow. Um, yeah. It's a nail biter. It's really, it's just, it's absolutely awesome. And then Artemis mission is, uh, is sort of the, the first, the, the, you're launching on an Artemis spacecraft, and it's kind of one of the first reconnaissance missions that is actually leading to people going back to the moon. So I hear this over and over and over again. Your, your mission is going to help basically, you know, determine future landing sites and all this stuff. So, so why is, is there any big general reason other than just we can do it now that there's this big uptick in just lunar research and getting people back there and all that stuff? Where does that come from? Yeah, I mean, I, I it probably the answer would probably depend on who you ask, but I, I feel like there has been a renewed interest in you know that there was a moon to Mars kind of story that came out of the last 
few years. And I think that the moon has really captured the interest of the overall exploration program as a gateway uh, to, to eventually getting people to Mars. Resources uh, on the moon that can then be used to just, you know, kind of take, yeah. take it to further and distances. Right? I, I think that's, that's the current thinking. And I, I think that there's, there's a really smart strategy in that, in that, you know, the astronauts that we send to the moon that are going to be on the surface, if, if anything goes wrong, we can get them back any, any day. <laughs> so <laughs> they can leave and come back and they'll be back within, you know, four or five days. Um, it's not the case on Mars. So, you know, you have to wait potentially a year to two years uh, to get back if something were to happen. So I, I think it's a really smart strategy to test out a lot of these technologies with, you know, we're going to have humans in a remote, very, very, the most remote environment ever uh, needing to survive and, and live off the resources that are there. Um, and it's going to be a very similar story at Mars. Uh, you know, you can't breathe outside on Mars. It's not very comfortable outside. It's, it's extremely cold. Um, so it's, it's uh, infinitely less hospitable than even Antarctica is here, even on Mars. So we want to test a lot of this stuff out. And I think, you know, the, the resources story, it's, it's cheaper to access water, which you can hydrolyze and make fuel uh, to, to get elsewhere in the solar system. It's cheaper to make it on the moon or grab it on the moon than it is to launch it off of the earth. Yeah. And so I think that's the general idea is if we can find pockets of uh, high quantities of water that are at the poles of the moon, we might be able to use those as a launching pad for you know, missions to Mars. Uh, sure. So I, I think that's, that's part of the idea. Well, congratulations. It's just, you're which is well positioned to be here at exactly the right time to get, to get all of that, that, that data and that science done. So. Hey, I just we wanted to play uh, another little movie. I just I, I love this. So yeah. This is this is the uh, the spacecraft heading for uh, leaving our building and, and heading for NASA. So let's let's take a look. SU, we made the final checkout, made sure the spacecraft was functional, put it into a large suitcase and sealed that up, headed off to the airport, went through TSA screening with our gate. And uh, once we were on board, the spacecraft got buckled into its own seat in the middle. Most comfortable having it next to us. It likely will not fit in the overhead bin duration of the flight to Orlando. After we landed, carried the spacecraft through the airport. Lots of moving sidewalks, lots of escalators. So made sure we carefully got it to the rental car agency to pick up our rental car where the spacecraft was then buckled in again and drove to the hotel near NASA Kennedy Space Center. The spacecraft spent the night with us in the hotel. Then the next morning we were able to get up and bring it over to NASA Kennedy Space Center and and the SLS team takes possession of the spacecraft and integrates the spacecraft, which is integrated into the dispenser onto the main rocket. I just think I, that's, that's maybe the coolest part of the story. Is that, you know, I mean, we think about these spacecraft as being these giant things, and giant scaffolds, and thousands of people working to make them uh, like launch. <clears throat> And here you got people I see every day just kind of like going to lunch. And uh, so I think this is really super cool. Cool, oh, good. Hey, so uh, I'm hoping that we have some audience questions. And so I'm going to ask uh, my team to kind of come in and help us sort of like orchestrate them. We'll see where we go. We do have questions. We have some wonderful questions um, okay. for Craig and the Loon Map team. And a lot, a lot of questions. So the first one, it, it's kind of a two parter, it's from Ryan. Um, he asks, do we have a ratio of the amount of water we think could be on the moon compared to the amount of total water on Earth? And then additionally, do we have any idea on what amount of water on the moon would be considered significant and usable versus not? Yeah, the, the answer to the second question is a little easier. Uh, so I think that, so there's a rover, the one I mentioned called Viper, um, that is going to land at the south pole of the moon in a couple years. And they did a study to actually answer that question. What is a meaningful quantity uh, that would be useful? And they determined that it was five weight percent uh, H2O. 
uh, within a parcel of, of, the, of the lunar regolith. Uh, so uh, for a neutron, I showed you guys some numbers like uh, 200 to 500 parts per million. Uh, five weight percent would be about 5,000 parts per million um, for us. So if that was at the South Pole and it was uh, at the spatial scale that Luna map is sensitive to, we would absolutely see that uh, very quickly. Um, the other question is uh, how much is on Earth? Um, I could say, uh, like I said, so at the South Pole of the Moon, we're talking about maybe uh, 500 parts per million at large spatial scales. Um, in the desert southwest, we're talking about sort of 30 to 40 weight percent, uh, even in very dry regions. Uh, it's pretty hydrated on Earth. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of clay minerals. We have a lot of uh, hydrated materials that are in our soils. Um, and so uh, the Earth is just a very different place. Uh, so if you were to take the same soil that we have out in Arizona and put it on the moon, it would be very, very, very valuable. Uh, some of the wettest stuff on the moon. <laughs> so uh, I hope that helps answer a little bit of the question. Yeah, I think that really does. And then we also have one from Alejandro who asks, um, can Luna, or wait, actually, uh, we have, we have I'll, I'll do Alejandro's question too, uh, since I mentioned it. Um, can Luna map only detect water on the surface of the moon? Um, Meaning, uh, is, is the question... As opposed to like maybe at depth, I think. Oh, um, yeah. So we're sensitive to uh, a meter down, uh, which actually is pretty good for most remote sensing instruments. Um, if you're thinking about like a visible spectrometer, like just reflected visible light, you're really only sensitive to the top micron or so of the surface that's interacting with the photons that you see. Um, so unless the only other thing that would really get any deeper is radar, uh, which uses microwaves, um, and then you you don't really you're not sensitive to hydrogen per se. Um, so neutrons are and gamma rays are really a, a unique uh, tool for planetary scientists to use in that we get beyond that optical depth uh, of microns down to uh, tens of centimeters to a meter. Um, so we can really you can hopefully get beneath what we're thinking of as like the area that's been gardened by micrometeorite impacts over the past uh, tens of millions of years. Great. And then there are a ton of questions, but this, this will be the last one. That, so we keep on track. Um, from Marcella, uh, when do you expect to receive the first piece of data from LUNMAP? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so the, uh, the launch, so I mentioned this tissue box size propulsion system. Uh, it's not a very strong propulsion system. So we have to most missions would be able to, uh, you could think of them like their propulsion system is like a hammer. So you get close to the moon, boom, hit the propulsion system and you're in lunar orbit. For us, it's like this very slow uh, blowing a fan. Uh, and so that's really all we're doing. And so we have to do that over a really long period of time. Uh, and so we're really subject to the celestial mechanics of what's happening. The Earth, Moon, Sun position at the time of launch is really important for us. And that's going to increase or decrease our mission duration by about a year. So if we launch in March, so just a few months from now, um, we'll probably be taking those science measurements, we'll be in that science orbit um, about a year and two months from launch. So early-ish, uh, sort of middle of next year is when we'd be into that science orbit. Uh, if the launch date gets, if it slips by a bit uh, and we're in a non-optimal uh, Earth, Moon, Sun position, then our propulsion system has to do a lot more work. It takes us a lot longer to get into that science orbit. Um, and we might be looking at summer of 2023 or so to be uh, making the science measurements. Um, so it's the, it's how, it cr how the cookie crumbles with uh, a weak <laughs> propulsion this, system. This is not bad. It's so missions take many, 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 many years. So to think that you might have to wait 18 months before you actually get some science, that's not so bad, I don't think. It's the relativity of it all, you know. The moon's yeah. been around for a while. It can wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for answering those questions. And that's, and we, we have a bunch in chat. So, you know, hopefully we can get to some of those that we haven't answered live. Um, but thank you to all of those who had all those great questions. Thanks. Super cool. Craig, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I just, I just really, I just think it's, um, I just think this is an amazing product of ASU and uh, that makes us important. That makes Arizona an amazing state for this kind of research and what we're able to bring to the uh, science community. And so, and you're just a really integral part of that. So, so well, thanks, thanks for, for having this. me. Congratulations for your, uh, 
for your project and and we'll be able to keep people up to date so right if people come back and visit us every other wednesday right so we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep it posted when this thing launches we'll have a big celebration we'll definitely pop the, pop yeah. the champagne for that one right yeah they're, and there are great questions thank you for for everybody for asking those and uh i just would end with saying these these types of spacecraft uh nasa wants to launch on every interplanetary mission so uh, hopefully these and the other nine that are on SLS are successful and you'll be seeing more of these types of spacecraft exploring the solar system uh, with every NASA mission in the future. And more about heading to the moon. So I think that's really good. And that's the theme for tonight. Well, thank you. Thank you, Greg, very much. I think that's we right. have a couple of just poll questions. Uh, just so you take a little breather, a little break. We're going to transition to the, uh, the second half of the program or the second part of the program. And so uh, let me just have... Uh, have the team launch some polls we'll also get the questions answered real quick so there you go if you haven't done polls yet just so you know this is an audience participation thing so you get to do this uh so so just kind of the first question is what is a psr if you were paying attention you would know exactly what a psr is by now so, so try that try that please so there you go people are weighing in and then we also have our second question attached, Rick, that says, what do we call two full moons in one month? So uh, this is not a joke. There is an actual answer here. And um, go ahead and cast your, your votes for those below. But yes, two-parter question. So what is a PSR? You know, and I think I can tell kind of right off the bat that our audience is kind of savvy. They're not going to fall for anything here. So. They're pretty quick with it. They've been sticking with us for a while now. They should know a lot of this. So uh, I think maybe now's a good time to end this, but it looks like 95% of us got that first question right with it being a permanently shadowed region. So yes, ESR, Dr. Hardgrove taught us well, it is a permanently shadowed region. Um, and then what do we call two full moons? A bit of foreshadowing, Rick's gonna talk about this, but we do call it a blue moon. So I'm sure you've heard that expression once in a blue moon, and that's where it comes from when we have two full moons in one month. Uh, but with that being said, I'm going to pass it back to Rick to talk to us about, uh, well, about Luna, hopefully. Let's just kind of launch a little discussion about this. So for those who've been around for a long time, you know, this is my dog. Her name is Luna. And uh, she does really seem to kind of like to sit out on a little table out in our backyard and kind of look around. I think she's smelling the neighborhood rather than looking at the moon, but it's a, it's a very romantic image. So I sort of like, uh, like introducing it. And, uh, and after all, her name is Luna and she cares. So I'm just gonna kind of get you out. I wanted to just talk a lot about the moon today and how it fits into our calendar. I, I, I hope that people realize uh, that the name uh, moon means month, right? Month, a uh, division of our year comes from the moon. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. I'm going to just kind of change the size of some of these objects. I'm going to make the moon a little bigger and the earth a little bit bigger. And I'm going to add an orbit to the moon. And I'm going to talk uh, especially just right off the bat about um, different lunar months and what that means. And so here you see the earth moon relationship. You see the sun in the background over there. Uh, but the first one I'm going to talk about is actually, uh, uh, it's called uh, the, the sidereal moon, if you want. So I'm just going to kind of move this to a place. It'll just take a second to get there. <clears throat> and if you notice here, I'm sort of setting up a scene where the moon is up against a background star. That star happens to be Antares. It's part of uh, uh, Scorpius, it's in kind of the southern part of our sky. It's very bright and it's very close to the ecliptic plane. So the moon is going to pass by it often enough. And if I just sort of just kind of move everything forward for a little while, the first month I wanted to talk about in a lunar system of orbits is what we call a sidereal month here. Let me just sort of give you a little sort of like hint about what that might look like. When the moon goes around star to star, uh, it defines a month of its orbit. I stopped a little late, sorry about that. And that's 27.32 days on average. Um, the moon has this uh, very funny and, and orbital properties and all that stuff. So it's a little faster, a little slower sometimes, all this stuff. So on average, we're going to call this month the month related to moon moving star to star, getting back to the same position against the night sky. We'll call that a sidereal month. Does that sound all right with everybody? The next one I was going to talk about is uh, sort of a phase month. So let me just get this set up here real quick. 
what you're going to see here is um, <clears throat> we'll get these into position and you're going to see in that little inset window, I'm going to show you both um, the movement of the moon in space and I'm going to show you what we get to see from home. And so this is now. And so you see the orientation of the moon and the earth. And when we look at it, we're seeing this. This is called a waning crescent phase. And if I just move ahead, let me just move ahead like four days because you're gonna see uh, this weekend um, that, um, that we're gonna end up with a new moon. And so see if I can get a time just right. And so the moon has moved ahead in its orbit four days. And what that does is that puts it sort of in an alignment with the sun. And I'm gonna organize that right here and all that stuff. So, so just, just to start the discussion of phases, there's three things going on here. You've got the position of the earth, the position of the moon and the position of the sun. In the first month I was showing you that sidereal month, the sun didn't count. That's just the moon up against the background of stars. Uh, of course, for us and the way we visualize the moon, the way we see it every month, um, of course it's phase. So as I move through this, you'll see as it's a, the moon moves around its cycle, uh, when it gets on the other side of the earth, that's when you see it as a full moon. Now is the waning moon. It now is about what it is right now. Uh, we call this, I'll let it go around once more. So we call this a waxing crescent as it becomes new, a half moon, a waxing gibbous, a full moon, a waning gibbous as it starts to shrink, uh, another third quarter half moon and a waning crescent and then back to the new moon phase as it sort of gets near the sun. This particular month, we're gonna call a synodic month, and it's gonna be 29 and a half days. So if you're paying attention to the, the uh, sidereal one, that is 27.3, this one is 29.5. So there's a 2.2 and a quarter day difference between the orbit of the moon, the month that a moon makes in its orbit, between the ones that are sort of phase related and the ones that are star related. And this becomes important because this sort of starts to, to talk about other things as we go forward. I'm going to uh, end this scene. I'm gonna add a little plane. I'm gonna call this, and let me turn off that picture. I'm gonna call this the plane of the ecliptic. <clears throat> and that's to sort of just shoot this little plane out from the earth. Let me make that moon a little bigger. <clears throat> Oops. Let me put its orbit back into place. Earth just a little bigger, so oops, too big, so you can see where that is. And what I'm showing you here is the orbit of the moon, and you can see that it actually sort of is inclined to the orbit of the rest of the solar system just a little bit. It, it isn't even, right? So we call this inclination. The inclination is about, oh, I'm sorry, I'm moving too fast. The inclination is about five and a half degrees. So that means when it gets out to this point over here, it's about five degrees above the ecliptic, the, the pathway that the planets take. And when it's down on the other side, it uh, sort of like goes below the plane of the, uh, the ecliptic and the so And so what this describes, and this is really, really important, a key factor that we've got to talk about is where it moves below the plane. This is called the descending node. Now it's under the plane and in just a second, uh, there it is, it's gonna hit the ascending node. And so these two nodes become part of the lunar orbit. Let me light up another month here. So this is called a draconic month and it's 27.2 days. This is the month that relates to nodes. So from ascending node all the way around again to ascending node. This one becomes really important because this is how the moon sort of organizes itself to form eclipses. And so I am going to stop for a second. I'm going to go to what I happen to know is the next eclipse, the lunar eclipse, and it's going to be in May. Let me just sort of get back there real quick. Watch out, here we go. And you'll notice that what's going on here is that node over here and over here is aligning with the sun. It doesn't always do that. These nodes actually process through time. They change position. It always has two nodes and changes position. And so if I just move ahead, oh gosh, I'm just gonna go several hours now. You're gonna find that the moon is going to sort of move into a position, maybe a little bit, where the nodes align. 
And that is going to be the eclipse. So the eclipse can only happen, oops, I saw they went two days instead of uh, two hours. Sorry about that, let me move back. Uh, so eclipses can only happen when these nodes align with the sun. And the lunar orbit that makes that happen is 27.2 uh, days. So these are all different ways to describe a month. Uh, what do we think of a month, right? Isn't a month uh, in a calendar year, we have our standard months, it's January. We divide our months so that they equal an entire year. Some have 31 days, some have 30 days, one has 28 days. You sort of know the month story. Uh, but that's kind of important because um, there's a solar month or a solar calendar or a civil calendar is the one that we use um, uh, to talk about. <clears throat> I'm going to go just to another location, so I'm trying to change position here because there's one more month that I want to show you. So uh, in our calendar year, we use civil months. That means we have just defined what their length is in days, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the moon. So the moon has its own months, as we've already seen. The last one I want to show you, let's see if you can pronounce this, is animalistic month, and that's 27.55 days, and this relates to the apses. So the, the, the lunar orbit is is elliptical, not round, and that means that the moon is closer to the Earth at part of its orbit and further from the Earth at another part. The other thing that that does is the moon moves across this particular, this is the closer distance here, as the moon moves across here, it moves a little bit faster. As the moon moves over here at apogee, it's called perigee and apogee, as it moves over here, it moves a little bit slower. So when we're talking about those abouts, when I say it's about 27.55 days or about 27.3 days, uh, that just means that the moon is in a certain position related to its apses, and that actually sort of has something to do with it. You'll see in just a moment, I'm gonna show you a little sideshow about this, uh, that uh, this actually sort of relates to that notion of supermoon, when the moon is a little closer, when it's full and it's closer and all that stuff. So it also does its orbit, it goes from perigee to apogee and back to perigee again. And, uh, and while it does that, uh, it takes 27.52 days to do it. Let me just mark the moment over here. Oops, I moved my cursor so I can stop the moving. I'm getting too far away. Anyways, <coughs> many, many different ways to talk about the month and really related to the very complicated uh, celestial mechanics, the really complicated part of the moon. And uh, so I'm gonna kind of stop that part right there. I'm going to stop share this. You've seen uh, all these months. The two that I want you to really think about now for a moment is the synodic month phases at 29 and a half days and the draconic month nodes at 27.2 days because this relates to a cycle of eclipses and all of that stuff. Okay, uh, let me do this. This is going to be a stop share over here. I'm going to share another screen for you over here just to, to show you a little bit of it. Um, if you've known me for very long, you know I actually sort of really like the uh, uh, the uh, Farmer's Almanac. I just think it's uh, really kind of kind of cool, and not because it's a sciencey thing. It's kind of a little bit folksy um, and all that stuff. But I pick one up every year, and so I'm just going to kind of just show you all of those little month things I just did. Uh, in the context of the Farmer's Almanac, the old Farmer's Almanac. So I've got the one from 2022 here. We're looking at the month of January. Let me do a little blow up here. And so this is how these work. You can see that uh, uh, essentially it's just the list of days, right? In January, one through 31. But let me just point out some things. Look at that, it calls out for you that new moon. And it also calls out for you the full moon. And you notice that they're just about 14 days apart, right? Remember this particular cycle, this is the one that is synodic. This is the phase cycle. Uh, this one is a little bit longer. The next new moon is going to be uh, on February the 1st. And we're going to kind of finish our program with that because that's kind of uh, the Chinese New Year. And we'll talk about why that's important. Uh, you might notice also down here uh, that the full moon has a name. It's called Wolf Moon. That's not named after Luna, my dog. That's actually sort of just, it's a true name of moons. And it turns out that all of the months 
uh, have a full moon, and they all have a name to them. So you see here, wolf moon, snow moon, worm moon in March, that is when the ground sort of uh, 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 thaws a little bit, right? The frozen ground through thaws and worms can start to climb up. So that's the month you're gonna find that. Pink moon relates to a, a particular flower that blooms in April. Uh, flower moon, strawberry, these are pretty, uh, everybody has heard of September, the harvest moon, shine on, shine on harvest moon. So when you look at the, a full moon the next time, right? Next time you see one, uh, just always remember sort of in the background somewhere, uh, this is historic and this is cultural and this has been going on for a long, long time. And all of these moons have a particular name. Do you remember that poll question we asked, what's a blue moon? It turns out that what happens is every time there are two full moons in a month, we should talk about that for a second, a full moon can happen in the first or second day of the month. It's not January, it's not happening now. And 29 and a half days later, it could happen again in the 30th or 31st, right? And so two full moons in a month, the first one will take the name of its moon and the second one will be called a blue moon. If you've ever heard that term, term like once in a blue moon, like as if that's a long time period, uh, that's where that comes from. <clears throat> here is the cycle of parody. Remember I said that it's closer sometimes, further sometimes. So here's the moon sort of at, at the closest approach, furthest approach. And it has two of those, so back over here. And this cycle is going to be a little quicker. Not 29 and a half days divided by two, but 27 or so days divided by two. So you're going to see that. When the moon has, is at perigee, which is up here, and is a full moon, that's when you get this term called supermoon. That means that because it's full and it's big and it's really prominent in the night sky, but it's also close to you. The next time that happens this year is in July. So you get to see that. We have those nodes, remember? Here's the date it's coming. It's ascending, kind of kind of coming out from below the plane. Here's the date that it's descending, the draconic mode. Draconic actually also has an interesting story. It is no, it was thought in Babylonian times that the nodes were occupied by a dragon. And so as the moon sort of moved through those nodes, the dragon could swallow the moon. And that is the answer for why there's eclipses. And so here we are, a very scientific term, uh, several thousand years later, we're calling it a draconic cycle or the draconic uh, 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 cycle of the moon. And it comes from this ancient idea of, of those. So, so I think that's really cool. Really quickly, I just want to talk to you about a little bit of the significance of the moon and how it starts to set a calendar for so in this image, I've got four sort of major, three major religions and the Chinese New Year. All of these have some sort of link to the moon, some more than others. In Islam, in that particular faith, the new moon is the start of every month. It is the start of their religious cycle. Their programming happens. Ramadan happens at a new moon. It starts. And they do not subtract, they don't sort of organize it to become calendar. Other moon systems or lunar solar, they will sort of like organize a separate month to sort of bring things on track again. So if you take the lunar cycles, 12 phased moons, 12 lunations, 12 full moons, and call those their months, you're going to be about 10 or 11 days short of a year. In the Islam faith, they stick with the moon, that is their calendar, and they do not adjust for that. So those major milestones in the Islam calendar, especially sort of the, the, the Ramadan, which is their most important celebration, it actually subtracts about 10 to 11 days every year, and it will move all the way around the calendar. Of course, you can sort of imagine in about 30 years, that sort of like moves all the way around back to, to uh, uh, the same season again. In the Jewish faith, they use lunar calendars for everything. So every, the new moon triggers things. That, that's how their celebrations are, are set up. That's how they're organized. And if you notice those, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, that they move a little bit sort of over time and they're not always the same date. It's all that because it's tied to the moon. But they have this system where every couple of years they add another month. So it subtracts 10, it subtracts 10 or 11, and then after the time they add a month to get everything back again. So their celebrations stay in the same time period of the year, but only through this idea about adding an intercalary month 
a new one just to sort of like bring it back into it. So, and there's a, there's a long history of that, thousands and thousands of years of history about how that works and who has done it and how that works. In the Christian faith, we actually sort of adopt more of an annual calendar, but Easter is the best since the celebration of the year. And uh, it is actually triggered by a full moon. So Easter has to happen after the vernal equinox, just right after the spring. So it has to be after March 21st or so. Or, or so what? Then uh, we have to have a lunar cycle that has a full moon, and then it becomes the next Sunday after that. So if you notice also, Easter moves around a little bit. It just sort, of, sort of varies. That's the trigger for that, and the moon is brought into phase. One of the most biggest celebrations in the world is starting this weekend. Uh, so the Chinese New Year is about to happen. It's the year of the tiger. There will be a new moon, uh, uh, this coming uh, weekend on Sunday, and then uh, beginning on um, Monday, you should be able to see it as a little tiny sliver of question. This is going to be a little tiny sliver, like a fingernail moon. Uh, this is going to be your assignment for this week, if you don't mind. I do like to give you assignments. And uh, I am going to, uh, I'm afraid we're going to go a little long, but I hope that's all right with you because I got a little bit more I wanted to cover. I'm just going to kind of keep going a little bit because I've got some more to show you. Um, I want to send you out there to look for that because, well, millions and millions and millions and millions of other people will. So you might as well sort of like get, get organized to be part of the, uh, the, the Chinese New Year celebration. It starts on one of the first new moons after the first of the year. Um, and it also, like the Jewish calendar, they adjust, they add an extra month every once in a while just to sort of make it work and they could do that. Um, let me just sort of see if I can do the screen sharing thing. Um, so I'm gonna share another screen and give you a little assignment to look at as we go forward. Just oh, 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 oh. will take a second here. Um, what I'm showing you is essentially, uh, this is uh, February the 1st. This is on Tuesday next week. And so you see the moon just sort of right here, just, uh, just above the horizon. Here is the sun right here, just below the horizon. Uh, it will have been a new moon the night before. So um, you can just kind of move that into place so you can see that. Uh, so this is Monday the 21st. The official start of the Chinese New Year is, uh, is Tuesday on February 1st. And you should be able to see, this is going to be a little challenge. You should be able to see a tiny, tiny sliver of a crescent moon next Tuesday, right after sunset, in exactly the same direction of the sun. And then the cool thing will be to look at it the next night, and it will be in conjunction with Jupiter. This is Jupiter, the planet. Here's the moon. You can start to see that it's, uh, its crescent phase is starting to show itself a little bit. Um, in, in these religious cycles, it isn't the astronomical new moon that triggers this, when the moon is right next to the sun, when that particular happens. It's actually when you can visually see it. So the cycle of these months and the launch of this, these, these uh, celebrations actually start not at the scientific new moon, but at the time that human beings can look at the night sky and they can actually see the crescent. And believe me, for thousands of years, people have been going out and doing just this, just to confirm those cycles, to confirm those, uh, those particular um, uh, aspects of our of our, uh, our religious cycles and our new year cycles and all of that sort of stuff. So I want you to be a part of that. Go check it out. Uh, next Tuesday night, you're gonna look for the thinnest of little slivers and you gotta get there right after sunset, just when it's dark enough to see the moon. Hopefully you'll see it. The next night, you definitely will. And the moon will be next to uh, Jupiter. And then if you're into celebrating the Chinese new year, it goes on for 14 days. It will just keep going until the moon is all the way up to its full phase uh, 14 days later. And uh, it is quite the celebration. Each one of those nights means something in this particular celebration. 
and uh, and uh, you can actually sort of do this. So uh, order up next Tuesday your Chinese food. Get out there right at sunset. Take a look at the moon and uh, let's see what you see. Okay. Sorry, we're going a little bit long. I'm going to just kind of reintroduce my team uh, just to come back. And we got just a couple more things to share with you. And then I'm going to talk to you about uh, one more thing that we, uh, we're, we're tackling right now. I call it the five things. And tonight is thing number two. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm going to take things over with our current event for tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just very quickly, uh, this week's current events are all things James Webb Space Telescope related. So very exciting news. The James Webb Space Telescope launched and we did cover that. Um, some of you may have been at the viewing party with us via uh, Zoom. But basically, we're excited to announce that the James Webb Space Telescope has reached the L2 point, the Lagrangian 2 point, and it is about a million miles away from Earth right now. And so to explain a little bit more about that, I can't think of anyone better than uh, the people who built the spacecraft. So CNN put together a nice little video that interviewed several people um, that helped with the spacecraft, and I'm here to show it to you today. So without further ado, I'm going to play this video. You know, at some point you build a telescope that's too big to fit in a rocket, and James Webb would not fit in a rocket. So we had to make the primary mirror into individual segments. It's been done on the ground once or twice, but Doing it in space is a whole nother set of challenges. Is it gonna hold? Is it gonna keep its strength? Is it gonna keep its alignment? Will it deploy? This is a worldwide telescope. It's the collective investment from the US and the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, that all these countries are willing to make to reach the edge of the universe. Separating from the upper stage, separating so we're going to L2. The stakes are tremendous. Uh, if, if you think back to Mars Science Lab Curiosity, uh, the seven minutes of terror waiting for it to get to the surface, uh, we were all holding our breaths. So I didn't hold it for seven minutes, but I held it for a long time, uh, waiting for that signal back from the surface. In this case, we're gonna hold our breaths for a couple of weeks because that's how long it's gonna to take to get all those deployments out after launch. Adding whatever Delta V we need there are over you know, 300 or 400 different operations that have to occur in space to make this telescope actually come to life. The huge sunshade has to deploy, which is the size of a tennis court. At this point, things get pretty critical because now everything starts to cool quickly. Solar array for maximum power. So now we've got to get the telescope unfolded before it gets too cold and the joints freeze up. Then got to get the instruments started. And each one of these things has to work perfectly first time. So did it work? Well, the answer is we think so. So as of right now, uh, James Webb Space Telescope is in the L2 point a million miles from Earth and things have been set up. So I think the next steps are cooling and uh, processing or testing equipment. So make sure that you stay current on current events and yes, check back with more. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to pass it to the James Webb Space Telescope master himself to take over resources of this week, I believe. So Alex Blanche, if you're available for comment, uh, perhaps you can tackle this week's resources. Yes, I can. Um, yeah, I, I'll just I'll just add that. Uh, yeah, I'm happy about James Webb. James Webb's done a good job, and hopefully he'll continue to do a good job. But yeah, we do have resources this week, um, more closely connected to our friends in LunaMap. Um, we're going to share their website with all of you guys today because. Um, it's a great place to learn more about uh, the mission that's going to happen, the launch, and uh, when we're going to start first seeing that results. Um, so let me show you this website. This is LunaMap's website via ASU. This is lunamap.asu.edu. Don't forget the silent H. Um, 
So here you can learn about the science that's going to do, what the mission is, um, a lot more about the team, and just get a lot of really good information. You know, we have some videos here. Um, you know, here's a picture of that classic suitcase that went on the airplane. But this is a great website to just learn more about the mission. And um, from this page, you can kind of maybe find some other ASU missions that we're involved in and uh, that are kind of similar. So this is the resource of the week. Be sure to check this out and learn more about Lunamap from beyond what you just learned tonight. So yeah, that's our resource. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alicia. This is actually great. So I really look forward to it. It is just not that hard to find things to talk about every two weeks. And so if you've been following, all of these resources are also available to you after the show. And, uh, and you get it in the way of an email from uh, uh, Kim Baptista, our webmaster. She'll send you a thank you and she'll send you a follow-up. Included in there will be some of these resources that you can go back and just kind of learn on your own. So I'm, I'm going to leave you with one more just sort of editorial thought. Um, let me share another screen, unfortunately. Um, the, um, uh, are we tired of Zoom yet? I think I am. Um, a couple of years ago, I kind of put together a, a little program that I thought was kind of important about um, 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 sort of understanding uh, our link to time or link to the, to the systems of the universe and all that stuff. And if you know, I mean, one of the driving things we're talking about here when you come and visit us and we're talking about is, is how to see the night sky, how to just sort of enjoy it, how to understand it, how to uh, see into the past what other people did. And especially about how the night sky and movement of those planets sort of is, is organized to set up our rhythms, their natural rhythms and things like that. And I came to this idea about four or five years ago that we're sort of like disconnecting ourselves from these systems of time. Tonight, I talked to you a lot about the moon and all of these, these orbit characteristics and all of these different definitions of a month, none of them actually add up to a year. And that's really kind of important for us to understand what that is. So uh, I started with thing number one last year, and I just think of the five ways that we can reconnect. Uh, and so we're gonna take one every session for the next five sessions. Uh, and we, so last, two weeks ago, we talked about what we could do is sort of like just kind of connect to something annually, uh, constellations in the skies. These things are rock solid rhythm. These things happen every year. You can't stop them. So understand a piece of the night sky, own it, watch it come back every year, uh, just be the thing, and it will be reliable. I swear it will. This has been going on for millions and millions of years, and it's a way for you to sort of like get connected to that particular fundamental rhythm that's really kind of important to us. Uh, today, I'm going to invite you to do something a little bit different, and that is take time to sort of see those things that are out of sequence. And so comets drift through, and we never know when they're going to come, and then they show up, and they sort of present themselves, and then they go away. Uh, unpredictable. Meteor showers are kind of predictable, but meteorite falls are not. Uh, Jackie, so the meteorite falls are not. So those kinds of things you have to sort of like, like um, you kind of like uh, when they happen, you have to become aware of them. Uh, I traveled one time to see the Aurora Borealis. That's an astronomical event that is absolutely spectacular, but you have to work to get there. We talked about the moon tonight. Eclipses, right? They're always a little bit different. Uh, sometimes they're really good. Uh, sometimes they're not partial. They're only partial. Sometimes they're full. Sometimes we get a good view of them. Sometimes you have to go someplace to see them. Uh, so, so work hard to watch for these things. Wait for them to come around. Take advantage of them. Just kind of get up in the middle of the night and go see something that you're not going to see very often. See something that uh, is, is what I call periodic. The juxtaposition between the two, I think, happens in the development of civilization. There are things that you can absolutely rock solid predict, right? You plant your crop, it rains, your crop's going to grow, and you get it. It might vary a little bit year to year, but that cycle remains. And then there are things that we can't predict. Uh, uh, famines, COVID, uh, uh, droughts, uh, those kinds of things that happen on a periodic schedule, schedule. And the same thing happens in nature. It's the things that we get to sort of like lock into and sync with. And then there's the things that are interesting and valuable that we have to sort of like connect to that are just periodic phenomena that happens every once in a while, maybe a once in a lifetime thing. So anyway, so thing number two. And there are five of them. We'll get to the third one next in a couple of weeks. And we'll see you then. Uh, and I'm sorry we just went so long. Uh, 
Craig was doing an amazing sort of presentation about Luna Map, and I hope you guys watch for that project and uh, see it launch in March with us. Uh, and uh, and uh, come back in two weeks, and we'll be back and talk about sort of the fundamentals again, and it will be about the sun and sky phenomenon, like atmospheric mm -hmm. phenomenon, and that will be sort of our our feature next week. And uh, we'll have some other things along the way. So thank you for attending. Thank you very much for uh, uh, sort of staying loyal to us. And uh, I can't wait to see you in two weeks. See you later. Thank you.